Hi, everybody, and welcome to U.S. Farm Report. The basic subject of this week's show is agriculture in the state of Idaho. And I'm delighted to welcome back to U.S. Farm Report as my special guest today, the recently re-elected National Vice President of NFO, Earhart Finkston. Fink, a pleasure to have you with us. Glad to be here. As you know, Fink, uh, the U.S. Farm Report crew took a field trip recently into the state of Texas, California, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, those great northwestern agricultural states. And uh, we have today some film on our show that we would like to show everybody looking in. So at this time, let's move to the state of Idaho and meet a young, progressive NFO farmer, Carl Eshelman. What attracted uh, you to NFO originally, Carl? Well, really, to start with, I was not in favor of it. Uh, through that milk holding action, dumping milk, I thought that the NFO told the members what to do. And uh, one neighbor, his brother-in-law, had joined, and, and he said, well, the next time there's a meeting closed, let's go and see just what it's about. So we did, and as soon as I found out that it was up to the members to do what they felt they needed to do, I joined, and I, within you know, two or three months, well, I started getting a little active in it, and by last fall, I just got to spending all my time in NFO, and then this spring, we chartered, in February, we chartered Ada County, and I was elected president. And then in July, we had our district convention, and I got elected uh, president of the first congressional district here in the state. And I've really been pretty active in it ever since. Have you uh, been able to feel some uh, positive effects of NFO through the county? Yes. Uh, we are holding the grain in the county real well. Even non-members have gone along and, and held their grain. And I can see a, a real change in the attitude in just the last few months. Carl, what is it that keeps the non-NFO farmer from joining when, when you run into a farmer who just uh, won't join? What, what are his reasons for not joining? Around here, uh, a few years ago, there was we raise a quite a bit of sweet corn, hybrid sweet corn in this area. And a few years ago, they got together and were going to get a better price. And uh, they just took all the sweet corn contracts out of this area and went to Washington and left these people sitting for a year. And uh, they just won't join. They're just afraid that if they get in and, and we start working for a contract, they're going to lose any contracts they've got. And I don't know, they're just afraid anymore. Uh, there's been so many different organizations in here try to do something and it just fell flat. Well, aren't some of these uh, farmers about to go under through this area? Yes. Uh, matter of fact, one of one of our members, I just talked to him this morning, and uh, he's been foreclosed on. And another one couldn't make it. He finally sold out here just a while back. And uh, there's a lot of them that I've talked to a lot of people, and they're just worried what to do. They don't know what to do. And they're just getting to the point that they're just ready to give up is what it amounts to. That was a portion of our visit with Carl Eshelman near Boise, Idaho, on the occasion of our recent U.S. Farm Report field trip to the Pacific Northwest. Some weeks after this visit to Boise, we had the opportunity to talk with Carl Eshelman again, this time at the National Convention of the National Farmers Organization in Louisville, Kentucky, in December. And here's the report at that time that Carl Eshelman gave us. Carl, how's everything in uh, the great state of Idaho? Well, I think it's starting to move real good. We're having That's some fine. effect out there. It's, it's really starting in. You know, uh, I can't tell you how much uh, we enjoyed coming out to visit you. Uh, I think that uh, all of the people looking in should uh, know that we came to the state of Idaho recently on a field trip for U.S. Farm Report, and uh, Carl here was uh, most cooperative and most hospitable, and uh, we enjoyed very much talking to you at that time. And at that time, uh, you were quite optimistic about uh, NFO and some of the accomplishments uh, around the Boise area and in your state. What's been happening lately? Well, about the latest thing we've had right in my area, we moved some pinto beans. And this is the first contract we've had on pinto beans, and 
nobody believed we could do it. Yeah. And we got three carloads out. There's three warehouses there, and we moved one out of each warehouse, <laughs> and it really affected the price. I'll bet it uh, did. When we started this, we went to Twin Falls, which is a major producing area over there in the eastern part of the state, and held a meeting on a Thursday evening. The next morning, we got back, and the price of beans had jumped 25 cents in our area. Yeah. So we had another meeting on Saturday night to make some more plans, and on Monday morning, it was up another 25 cents. So then we got a contract, and two hours before our first load went out, the price jumped another 50 cents on us. And it jumped above what we were getting, of course, because That's they had to be our price. Yeah. But then it came back down below what we got to. Yeah. How, uh, how's membership going? Some of the areas are really starting to move. Uh, we're picking up more new members all the time, and there's a, I've really seen a difference in the feelings of the farmers around their uh, attitude towards the NFO and collective bargaining in general. And uh, uh, <laughs> I was going to say there was another organization that had a meeting, but um, uh, they were also talking the same line. Okay, yeah. And uh, really the people, I think, are are getting a little closer. It's easier to talk to them all the time. This is what we uh, really found uh, all through the Northwest and through California and down in Texas and through the Midwest. We've been uh, feeling this, uh, this matter of membership on the rise for NFO and opposition on the decline and yes. prestige for the organization on the rise. Yes, that's right. And these are, are very important factors, of course, as we know. Well, it is to me. And, uh, of course, uh, the farmers have got it more further into the position that they've got to have a price. That's all there is to it. We just can't keep going. Their sugar beet acreage this year, their uh, yield was down. And now there's uh, almost a certainty there's going to be a cut in acreage next year. No. And this is really affecting the people. Have you cleared out any sagebrush lately? No, we haven't done any more of that. <laughs> oh, boy, I tell you, Carl comes from sagebrush country, folks. Uh, that country around there before irrigation was pretty desert-like, yeah, wasn't oh boy, it? Oh, boy, it just won't even grow good sagebrush, hardly. Yeah, it's right. dry. <laughs> it gets up tall, but it takes years to do it. But when it's cleared and farmed properly, as oh, yeah. uh, you and uh, the other good farmers of that area are able to do, it's beautiful country. Yeah, it really is. It really is. Well, you can get up on the hill and look down over, and it yeah. just looks like a paradise, really. You know, the um, the family farm we visited, uh, there were, what, four or five brothers? Uh, four were... brothers and a father. Yeah, what was their name? Herman, uh, Ted Brown family. Yes, how are they? Oh, they're fine. Uh, Any of them at convention? No, uh... Ted's brother died, and they couldn't make oh, it. They had to go to his funeral. Sorry to hear that. But, um, we bought some cattle from Browns, yeah. and uh, they're getting their cattle in off the range, I understand, and we're trying to get the rest of them. Well, like uh, all of the NFO farmers we met on our trip, they were most hospitable and wonderful oh, yeah. people. And, Carl, when you get back home, I want you to be sure to make a point to say hello to all of them from us on uh, U.S. Farm Report. I sure Do will. That? I sure will. I'll hey, give him a call first. Great. Matter of fact, I'll probably see Herman. Uh, well, next week we're having a district meeting. You'll carry the message. I there. sure will. It's been real good seeing you again. It's been a pleasure seeing you fellas again, and, too. Uh, we'll be back out one day. Yeah, well, I'll sure be happy to show you around some more if I can. Great. Fine. Before leaving Idaho, Carl Eshelman was kind enough to escort our U.S. Farm Report crew to the Ted Braun farm near Boise. Ted Braun came to the area of Cambridge, Idaho in Washington County from South Dakota in 1937. Today, with his four sons, Herman, Roy, Leo, and Harvey, Ted Braun is farming here where over 50% of the production of the county is NFO production. The Brauns boast a herd of 75 dairy cows and a herd of 170 stock cows. On this farm, they produce 1,100 tons of baled hay for feeding their herd. On this farm, there are 1,500 acres under cultivation. This father and son's operation represents a total investment in agriculture in excess of $400,000. The Browns are highly respected farmers and enthusiastic members of the National Farmers Organization. The Ted Braun family helped make our U.S. Farm Report tour of Idaho most pleasurable. From the Boise, Idaho area, 
our U.S. Farm Report crew moved into the Idaho Falls area, where we visited in front of the airport with another fine NFO member. Gerald, the Stolworthy family have resided in the Idaho Falls area now through three generations. When did your father first come here? In about 1900. He uh, come up in here uh, with livestock herding sheep. In the early days, he used to range his sheep from Idaho to Utah the year round and never feed them. I understand, I understand that he uh, is uh, very much uh, alive and in good health. He's 84 years old and drives his own car and gets around real well. Well, that's wonderful. Speaking of sheep, uh, you're a sheep man, and uh, I understand that through the years uh, you've herded sheep throughout this Snake River Valley. Yes, I have. Uh, most of this territory is not new to you, is it, for, no, for, for, for many miles stretching? I'm familiar with all the farms within a 30-mile radius of Idaho Falls. Uh -huh. Now, when uh, your family came here, the land that you're now farming, I guess, was in sagebrush, wasn't it? Yes, it was. And you've cleared it, and how many acres of land uh, do you and your brother own at this time? Well, I and my brother operate around five, or around 4,000 acres of irrigated ground. Uh -huh. I personally operate 2,000 acres of row crop land. Uh -huh. Now, uh, this is all irrigation through here. And as I understand it, uh, there have been some changes uh, forthcoming. Uh, the irrigation trend is now toward sprinklers, isn't it? Very much so. Why is that, Gerald? Well, uh, one man can handle so much more land and more labor efficiency and more efficient use of water mm -hmm. and better crops. Mm -hmm. Now, on your acreage, uh, you are uh, irrigating from the Snake River, and uh, you also are using wells, aren't you? I have four wells in operation and have uh, considerable water rights in the Snake River, decreed water rights. How far down do you have to go for your water? Well, in my particular area, I drill about... 300 feet and I have to lift the water about 150 feet. And what kind of a producing well does this uh, give you in terms of gallons per minute? Well, we have some wells that throw 3,700 gallons a minute. We have one well that throws 6,800 gallons per minute. Mm -hmm. Now, to get back to the Stolworthy family, you and your brother uh, no longer are in business together. You have separated your uh, farming lands and your operations, haven't you? We each operate individually. Yes. Now, you are in business with your son, Brent. Correct. And uh, Brent is a fine young man, a hard worker, and uh, a pretty good farmer, right? A real good farmer. Does your brother uh, have children? He has two sons farming with him. Mm -hmm. Well, it would appear that the Stolworthies in the next generation, perhaps, will be working this same land. We hope so. Let's talk about what you produce We'll get to your sheep in just a minute, but let's talk about what you're growing. Uh, you're a potato man. How many acres of potatoes do you grow here? This year we had 700 acres of potatoes. Now, it takes some doing, doesn't it, in terms of investment and efficiency to uh, get these potatoes out and to make yourself some money out of them. Well, it's a lot of work. I don't know how much <laughs> money we get out of it. <laughs> Now, for example, uh, the kind of harvesting equipment we've seen in operation here is pretty expensive. What does, uh, what does one of these modern uh, uh, combines cost, one of these modern harvesters? Well, they cost all the way from ten to $20,000. That's a lot of money, and it takes, of course, some good tractor power and an additional investment to pull them, doesn't you it? You at least have to have a ten to $15,000 tractor to pull them. What is your potato market situation in this part of Idaho? Well, we used to have a lot of independent dealers, but at the present time, processing industry is taking over, and I would dare say that six major processors are handling 80% of the production in Idaho, and Idaho produces a third of the potatoes that are used in the nation. Well, this will give us some indication of the influence of these producers in the uh, potato industry. What's the solution to this problem? Well, I think organization collective bargaining for the farmer. Farmers, the farming industry is the last segment of our national economy that don't have strong organization to set their prices. Mm -hmm. The farmer is the only one that puts everything into production and very little into marketing. Yeah. 
When were you first attracted to NFO and under what circumstances, Gerald? In the fall of 1967. What attracted you to the organization? Well, I heard uh, Bernard Grahn talk, and within three weeks I joined up. Mm -hmm. What has been the effect of NFO through this particular part of Idaho? Well, last year, in our marketing of potatoes, I know that uh, the NFO had a considerable bearing in the price thing of potatoes in Idaho. Through their uh, program of taking care of the small potatoes off in the market, I know that we made the growers a considerable amount of money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Leaving potatoes for a minute, uh, let's talk about sheep. And believe me, I don't know much about sheep, but I think you're most qualified to talk about them. Uh, you've been herding sheep all of your life, and uh, right now you have a sheep herd. How big is it? Well, I have a sheep set up of uh, 3,000 uh, breeding ewes, and then I have the lambs that go along with them. Mm -hmm. Now, what kind, of, uh, what kind of hay production do you have to support this herd? Well, we put up about 40,000 bales of hay each year, and we feed them on the ranches in the winter. Now, this, this 40,000 bales of hay, uh, this is quite an undertaking, but uh, as I understand it, with modern equipment such as it is, one man can uh, turn out this job and uh, never have to touch that hay at all. One man puts up all the hay with an automatic stacker. Well, exactly how does this work, Gerald? The balers go through the field and bale the hay. These stackers come in and pick up the hay and load it on the, the stacker. The stacker goes to the hay yard and unloads the hay automatically and then goes back to the field for another load. Mm -hmm. Gerald, I know that uh, you have in your employ several sheep herders. We had the pleasure of meeting one on our visit to uh, your place. I'm talking about Jim Fisher. Jim's quite a fellow, isn't he? Yes, he is. He's been with us about 15 years now. This fall, September, a horse fell on him, and he's in the hospital for a month or so, but he's back on the job again. Well, uh, he's going real strong. He really is. We have got a look today at how important a sheep herder can be and uh, really how important dogs are to a sheep herder. These dogs uh, working with Jim today uh, look very good. Are they, are they considered pretty good sheep dogs? Yes, they're Australian Shepherds and Border Collie. Uh -huh. You know, the sheep herder must lead somewhat a lonesome life. Uh, we have seen dotted on the landscape uh, around the Idaho Falls area what I call sheep herders trailers. I guess you call them something else, don't you? Well, we call them sheep camps. Sheep camps. Yeah. And these are really small trailers that uh, the sheep herder simply lives in, right? Yes. Follows the sheep over the range yeah. and goes into the summer range with them in the summer and stays with them in the winter with them. Well, now you have uh, a problem with sheep in this area that uh, we don't have with cattle, at least in the Midwest, and perhaps not through this region of the United States, and that is that you have to move them from, uh, from summer to, to winter uh, uh, grass, don't you? Yeah. From our uh, winter headquarters to the summer headquarters is about a distance of 50 miles. And how do you move them, Gerald? We trail them. The only sheep we haul is when we ship fat lambs out of the herds. Uh -huh. When is the lambing season? Uh, about the 1st of March. Now, we noticed at your place uh, several lambing sheds, I guess they're called, or uh, lambing barns. Why are they open at the top? Well, it's for sanitary conditions. Uh, we have canvas covers on them in the spring when we're lambing, and this lets the sunlight in and keeps the shed warmer and uh, kills the bacteria and lets the sunlight in, and then the covers are off the roof in the summer, and the sun ex uh, is exposed to all areas of the sheds, mm -hmm. and it helps keep down disease. Yes, indeed. You know, yours is the most attractive uh, home. Uh, I understand you and your brother built brick homes almost side by side, and in the meantime, he no longer lives there, and the other house has been sold. But yours is most attractive. And uh, two, I think you're to be complimented on uh, the grain storage facilities that you have. What's your capacity for storing grain right there on the farm? Well, we have a capacity of up to 100,000 bushel. Do you still need that kind of capacity? No, through government allotments and so forth, we're not farming that much <laughs> land now. <laughs> yeah. Gerald, what kind of a sheep market have you been enjoying the last few years? 
Well, the last two years has been good. This year has been better than it's been. But at times, we have had a very poor market for the cost of our production. Mm -hmm. And wool this year, uh, my brother hasn't sold his wool as yet. Is it's, that right? And he hasn't had no offers. Uh -huh. I sold mine on the early market at 44 cents. Do you feel that uh, NFO is working toward solving this problem? It's helping in there. In our um, This last year, I marketed a considerable amount of my grain under an NFO contract, and it made me money by going through NFO. Uh -huh. Are there a number of uh, NFO contracts through this region? We have uh, quite a few. It varies in areas. Some areas have been got together and had the leadership, and they're taking advantage of NFO. Mm -hmm. Others are a little slower to catch on, and it's a harder role to get the job done. Yeah. But in a whole, NFO is helping us. How about membership, Gerald? Is it uh, growing? It's growing steadily. Our membership has increased uh, quite a bit this last year. How many farmers do you feel you have in this county uh, in a percentage way? Well, we have up close to half of them. And what about production out of the county? We have a good part of the production. In some commodities, we have a, a controlling part of the production. Mr. Stolworthy is indeed a most enthusiastic NFO member, Fink. You know, the thing that we realized as we toured the state of Idaho, and in fact, many of the states in the northwestern part of the country, was that there is a great upsurge of membership there a great enthusiasm for NFO, perhaps unlike any other part of the country, I'm not sure. How do you account for this? Well, those people are businessmen. They have enormous investments in the operation. Those operations will run a million bucks and above in one, in, in one operation, uh, and anybody with that much money invested is going to do something to protect that investment. One difference between there and the Midwest in their enthusiasm for organization and for collective bargaining is that they have already gone through this getting bigger. Too many farmers believe that they just have to get bigger and that's it and then they'll be doing fine. Well, it's foolish reasoning because if you're not making anything on 500 acres and you double up, you farm a thousand, two times nothing is still nothing. <laughs> Indeed. So, so those people have already realized that size don't, doesn't do it that they have to have a price. And so they realize very well that if they think that as an individual who is large, has a large operation or a lot of production, if he has bargaining power even for one or two cents, that then they must have an awful lot of it if they get it together with thousands upon thousands of farmers producing the same thing. So I'd say they are businessmen. They have the attitude of a businessman. They're not only going to produce, they're going to see to it that they get the price. And this makes a big difference. Do you feel that uh, the terrain of the Northwest lends itself as readily to corporate farming as the flatlands of the Midwest, for example? Are these independent farmers in that part of the country uh, in danger as far as corporate farming is concerned? Oh, I think they're all in danger. There's just no question about it. The corporate structure that's setting up can operate at a loss for an indefinite period of time because they're getting their profit from other industries so they can operate at a loss and freeze the independent farmer out, then, of course, when they take over, you can bet that there's going to be a price. And I think the consumer had been, better be very much concerned about this because the family farm has been proven to be the definitely the most efficient unit of operation in agriculture anywhere in the world. In fact, there's nothing that has ever matched our uh, independent farms in the United States. And if this goes out, well, the consumer is really going to pay for it. There's mm -hmm. just no question about it. Well, in other words, then, think these uh, corporate farm operations are very diversified, lots of them. Well, yes, diversification and still specialization, too. See, mm -hmm. where they concentrate on one specific kind of production where an independent can no longer match yeah. it. This is what is happening. Now, mm -hmm. the reason I emphasize that the consumer had better be concerned about it, according to the economic indicator, the uh, Corporations listed on the New York Stock Exchange had roughly 10% more invested in their operation than the than American Family Farm or than agriculture did. And yet they made about 11 times as much profit on 10% more investment. So had the American farmer fared as well as a corporation or received the same kind of profit, 
he would have had to have had everything that he took in in gross as profit twice as much, and he would have had to have been paid $2.94 an hour for his work in addition to that, because keep in mind, the corporations have to pay the labor force. So uh, as near as I can figure it, if the corporate agriculture ever takes over, eliminates the family farm or the independent farmer, and prices their production the way they do in every other line, then food is going to have to cost at least four times as much as it does now to pay that kind of a profit. Four times four as much. Four times as much. Think, I know that you would urge the farmers of the northwestern part of the country, in Idaho, in fact, farmers all over the country, to join NFO. Oh, there's just no question about it. I think it's the only solution. Uh, if, if they stay as independents, they, they can be knocked off real easy. They're not going to have a market. We've already seen this in the poultry in industry and broilers. You can produce all you want, <clears throat> but you don't have a place to sell unless you're tied to that vertical integration or corporate structure. So this is what will happen to American agriculture. I think we don't have any more than two years' time to get together to get ourselves a price that pays the profit that lets the people stay in agriculture. I think, I think it's an absolute must. I think anybody can realize that once you get together in an economic force, you can do something about your problem. And the whole problem is farm prices, nothing else but that. I think anyone would have to recognize that the teachers have made gains since they organized. I think anyone would have to recognize that labor has uh, had a voice in establishing their pay. Well, what makes anybody think that the farmers wouldn't have power when they get together? So instead of sniveling and crying about their problems, the thing to do is get together with their fellow farmers in an organization and solve that problem. And the only chance that they have is through the NFO. I think I want to thank you very much. My pleasure. It's always our pleasure to have you as a guest on our show. Come back again soon. Will do. Our special guest, the National Vice President of NFO, Earhart Fingston. U.S. Farm Report is seen each week on this station until we meet again. So long, everybody.